Tomorrow morning, closing arguments will begin in Donald Trump's New York civil fraud case. At stake for Mr. Trump is a possible $370 million penalty and his ability to ever do business again in the state of New York. Yesterday, we learned that Trump himself was planning to deliver part of the defense team's closing argument. But today, the judge presiding over this case, Judge Arthur Ngoron, denied that request and posted his entire email exchange with Trump's attorney, Chris Kyes, on the court docket. For those of you who have not read it, it is colorful. Judge Ngoron initially said he would allow Mr. Trump to speak, but only if Trump would agree to several limitations, including one prohibiting a campaign speech. Trump's attorney rejected those limits, calling them untenable and complaining in the most Trumpy way imaginable. This is very unfair, Your Honor. You are not allowing President Trump, who has been wrongfully demeaned and belittled by an out of control, politically motivated attorney general, to speak about things that must be spoken about. Judge Ngoron's response, take it or leave it, now or never. You have until noon, seven minutes from now, all caps, I will not grant any further extensions. Trump's lawyers did not respond and their client will not be speaking tomorrow. Joining me now is Susan Glasser, staff writer at The New Yorker and co-author of The Divider. Um, Susan, <laughs> I was really struck by a number of different exchanges in this, this court uh, filing on the docket. But the first was the way in which Trump has managed to puppeteer literally every single person around him, including his lawyer in an email exchange with the judge. I mean, I, I am not a student of the law, but it just doesn't seem to be a very typical thing to have a lawyer writing things about um, a, 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 a wrongfully demeaned client uh, who has been belittled by an out of control, politically motivated attorney general, and that the client needs to speak about things that must be spoken about. Um, how do you, what do you make of the, the odd relationship that is, is being um, revealed here? You know, Alex, could I? Uh, I? I've always thought, and in fact, our reporting suggested that that Donald Trump was personally dictating many of the statements that it seemed like he was personally dictating, right? Whether that was from his White House communications office or his campaign team now, or his many, many different teams of lawyers. I think one issue that's clearly going to come up in 2024, in fact, is that Donald Trump is currently employing so many different lawyers in so many different legal proceedings. Uh, and your point about how is he possibly managing to uh, literally dictate what the content of individual email exchanges are with different lawyers and different judges in all these cases while also running for president? It's a pretty good question. Clearly, he took some time out of prepping from his uh, his town hall discussion on Fox News in order to uh, get involved in the, the nitty gritty of this exchange in New York. Yeah, there's another part where the, <laughs> the lawyer, Chris Kyes, writes, the attorney general seeks the unconscionable and draconian penalty of prohibiting President Trump, who has contributed both professionally and personally to the economic development, job growth and real estate footprint of New York for some 50 years. I mean, I'm surprised they didn't mention the crowd size at his inauguration in this email. It was like literally Trump verbatim. But to your point, there's only so many pieces of correspondence that Trump can dictate before he won't have any more time left in the day to actually mount a defense. Um, the other part of this that struck me was that Trump cites the death of his mother-in-law as a in a bid for um, an extension on this on these closing arguments. Susan, as you point out, Trump is still doing his Fox Town Hall tonight, and yet. That didn't seem that the, the timing of his mother-in-law's death did not affect his ability to participate in that. Um, is Trump the kind of person that mourns in, in your reporting to um, an unusual degree? There is not a lot of evidence to suggest that Donald Trump was particularly close either to uh, his wife's parents or, you know, that he even, for that matter, spends an enormous amount of time with Melania herself, who has been scarce in evidence uh, in, in the three years since Donald Trump left the White House and is not regularly by his side. Uh, so uh, there's not a lot in the in the public record to suggest that Donald Trump is 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 a grieving man tonight. Uh, if you look at him, uh, he doesn't seem to be in that in that mode. He's like the kid who's, you know, always saying that he can't turn in the term paper because another grandparent died until the teacher gets suspicious and says, wait a minute, how many grandparents do you have?
Yeah. Or and then is found at the video game arcade, like playing Pac-Man uh, when he's supposed to be grieving. Um, the, I did notice that there is a, a, a few lines from the attorney general that or the attorney general's office explains why it's important to not allow Trump to give a closing um, statement, a closing argument in, in this courtroom. And I'll just read an excerpt of uh, what they outlined. They basically say that Trump is prone to giving irrelevant speeches. He lacks self-control and is evasive to responding to questions. Allowing him to speak would invite more speeches, campaign style, that would disrupt the proceedings. I think that effectively nails uh, that that hits a uh, nail on the head in terms of why it's actually dangerous to have Trump give him unfettered access to uh, the microphones in these court proceedings. But it does beg the question, Susan, like this is an instance where the judge can say Trump cannot talk. There are going to be a lot more trials, presumably, or at least one or two. And there are going to be a lot more courthouse steps that Trump faces. And I think the question is, you know, how can the judicial system manage this process in a way that it does not become, uh, you know, effectively a series of stump speeches for the Trump candidacy. Yeah, no, I think this is the, the bigger picture context that's really relevant to 2024, Alex, is this question of the extent to which Donald Trump is able to turn these court proceedings that, against himself on very, very serious charges of uh, criminal malfeasance. In this particular case, he stands to you know, be penalized literally hundreds of millions of dollars. And yet Donald Trump is, is, remains firmly of the view that there's no microphone that can't be turned to his own advantages as long as it's turned on. And I think also he's looking at the experience that he had in 2023 when the enormous wall-to-wall -wall coverage uh, that attended his multiple indictments uh, in, and charges in the criminal cases against him, that that was actually, as he sees it, perhaps the key to his political resurrection. And, you know, the breathless coverage that, you know, hanging on his every little utterance. And I think that that has been factored into his campaign plan for 2024. And, and this judge, you know, has a pretty clear read on it. But um, you're right. If it's a matter of every single day in a criminal trial and he's standing on the steps, there's nothing to stop people from from live streaming that and giving Donald Trump this enormous, uh, unique campaigning uh, situation. Susan Glasser, always, always with the, the deep and thoughtful insight and great reporting. Thank you for joining me tonight. I appreciate it.